Thank you all for coming today. Welcome to the Anderson Gallery. I know some of you um, haven't met all of you. I'm Lila Anderson. I'm the gallery manager here. Um, delighted to have uh, Sean Downey here and to work on this exhibition. This is my first um, with the gallery and he's made it a real pleasure. So um, I wanna tell you a little bit about him and then I'll turn it over um, for his talk. Uh, Sean Downey received his BFA from the Kansas City Art Institute and MFA from Boston University. Um, he has recent sole exhibitions at Shelter in Place Gallery, Stephen Zevitas Gallery, and La Montaigne Gallery, all in Boston. Um, he's been included in recent group exhibitions at the Museum of Museums um, in Seattle, Washington, Rivalry Projects in Buffalo, New York, and Richard Heller Gallery in Santa Monica, California. Um, Abigail Oglevy Gallery, the Institute of Contemporary Art at Mecca in Portland, uh, Maine and the Leroy Neiman Gallery at Columbia University, among others. Uh, Downey was the founding member of the Boston-based curatorial collaborative, uh, Kij Dome. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but Kij Dome. Kij Dome. Uh, he's also the winner of the 2015 James and Audrey Foster Prize from the Institute of Contemporary Arts in Boston. Uh, his work has been featured in numerous magazines and publications, including Joya, Art Maze, New American Painting, uh, Make Magazine, and Hyperallergic. He currently lives and works in Fairfield, Iowa, and is a professor, associate professor of art at the Maharishi International University. So please help me to welcome him now to talk about <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about this. It's kind of like a weird format. I'm kind of excited about it too. It's the first time in probably six or seven years that I've got to gotten to speak about uh, my work like with the actual work around. Um, and so, and in this kind of intimate format. So um, uh, I was trying to kind of take advantage of that in putting the, the talk together because I don't feel maybe the pressure to kind of show every single image that's in the, the exhibition um, and so I've taken the opportunity to, to show some other artists work and then also to show um, some of the work that's not in the exhibition and then I even did something really nerdy which I'll show you at the end and I brought some of these like objects that I think about um, these kind of 19th century early 20th century uh, like screen technology kind of objects. Um, so I like yours, it's too, it's a little dark. I like it because it feels intense. like it's kind of like Zoom where I'm just speaking to a bunch of black screens. Uh, everyone has their camera off. But um, yeah, so uh, this is also nice. It's like I'm just alone in the room talking to myself. Uh, anyway, um, so when I think about my work and kind of especially putting a, a talk together like this, uh, the, the typical way that I would have done it was to talk sort of chronologically about the work. Um, but in thinking about this exhi exhibition being up and being sort of surrounded by the talk, um, it's, it made more sense to think of it more thematically and kind of the way I think about the work and like what the, the headspace is inside of this work. Um, and in the work, there's, and it's in the title of the exhibition, 200% of Life, um, and it's in a lot of the ways that I think about the work. There's this, all of this kind of, um, double and triple thinking that's happening at the same time. And, and there, there are many different ways that I think about that. Um, and some of the, the kind of main themes that are kind of all on the surface at the same time when I'm thinking about the work is kind of like the, the background or context of the work, like what's feeding into the work. Um, the, the images, like what these are paintings or images of um, and, the, and the references, and then like, the, the objects themselves as paintings and how they're constructed as paintings and, and all that kind of stuff, composition. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, and then the fourth thing is this kind of, that I'm particularly interested in, in, in this body of work is this like acknowledgement of the viewer or acknowledgement of like the act of viewing um, and, and this kind of like inside conversation that me as a maker and then as a viewer of these works and then you as a viewer viewing the works are, are sort of having and I want to make sure that I'm kind of like um, 
telling you that I understand that we're having a viewing experience when we, when we look at the work. And, and so a lot of the work that I, I'm, I'm interested in painting and image making of the past um, does that in some way, shape or form. Um, and a lot of times I think technology or the intervention of technology into the making process can be a way that you acknowledge uh, like the limitations of our own senses or our own perception and, and the ways that we can kind of collaborate with like non-human vision and things like that. Um, and it, it, in doing that, it makes one conscious of the way that we actually see, like what's how our eyes are operating. Um, even just the simple illusion of, um, you know, sort of representational painting, I think does that. And I'll talk more about that. But so this painting, I think is like a perfect example of it. This is a Hans Holbein painting, a lot of you I'm sure have encountered this, this painting. It, um, it's called The Ambassadors, it's from 1533. And you know, it has all of the sort of things uh, of, of image in it and narrative. There are these dudes and this uh, stuff and all the, the things around them. And it's even got all of this kind of narrative meaning of it up here, you've got the crucifixion um, kind of tucked away behind the curtain in the, in the tiny little slice of the corner of that painting. And so it's got it's got all that kind of narrative and story. And then it has this in the bottom of the painting, um, this uh, anamorphic skull, which um, if you see this, I saw this painting when I was in graduate school in person for the first time at the National Gallery in London. And the way it was hanging at the time was in the stairwell. So you would approach it almost from underneath the painting. So it kind of gave you a natural viewing of that skull. And so that's that that skull, if you look at it, the painting from head on looks like that. Um, this is a kind of digital compression of it, but this is essentially what it looks like if you look at the painting from down below looking up. And that, like, um, besides being a kind of what when I, you know, I first encountered this painting when I was younger, what felt like a very contemporary juxtaposition, like these two wildly different kind of um, image deployments kind of just slammed up against each other. Um, on top of that, it also has this uh, thing built into it where it kind of it implies that it understands that you're a person out there looking at the painting and that if you change your angle of looking at the painting, the painting changes. Um, and it does that in a very kind of overt, explicit way. But the, a lot of the work that I like uh, or sort of fed me throughout history does that um, in some other in, in other ways and sometimes in, in much subtler ways. This is a painting that I grew kind of obsessed with uh, when I lived in Boston. That's at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. It's by Rosa Fiorentino. And it's a really weird painting. It's like uh, about four, it's probably about the size of these, these paintings over here, uh, maybe a little bit smaller. Um, so the figure's not quite life size. Everything feels compressed in the space. And then uh, the thing that's the weirdest about it is everything feels smushed up against the picture plane. It almost looks like, like to me, like when you make like a photocopy of your face against the photocopy machine or whatever, scan your face, like everything in it feels kind of twisted and subtly like pressed and the, the space feels super shallow in the painting. Um, and when you view it, you feel very aware of that first, maybe in a kind of claustrophobic way, um, everything feels very packed in the space not just this way and this way, but then up toward you. And that makes you feel this kind of consciousness of yourself as like a viewer and everything kind of being smashed up against uh, the picture plane there. Um, this is a, another on the anamorphic um, sort of distortion side of things. This is a very strange painting that's in, the, uh, in a small collection in uh, Hartford, Connecticut, the Wadsworth Athenaeum. And this is a, a 17th century painting by an unknown Italian painter. And it's apparently part of a whole genre of anamorphic paintings. And again, as like a young painter and I encounter this, this painting and I was like, what the, this looks so contemporary, you know, like this does not look like an old painting. Um, and it's in this frame that's like, uh, that stands up and you're meant to sort of look at it from specific angles from the side. And when you do, it sort of crushes down and, and becomes a, a more legible uh, image. And this is a sort of digital compression of it that I made. But you can see the difference between this and that Holbein 
painting. Here, clearly there's some kind of technological intervention to get that kind of precision. And uh, this painting feels much more like almost like it was hand done, like it was like someone was on the side of the painting. So you almost feel the painter on the side of the painting, like looking and trying to paint it like this. Um, and that, that kind of uh, way of looking at painting is sort of, I spent the majority of my 20s like working in museums um, as like a ticket taker and a coat checker and doing installation and working with registrars um, in museums in Kansas City and San Francisco and New York. Um, and I always loved museums. I loved like walking through like old collections, especially like the rooms that nobody goes in. Um, and it, the objects in those rooms never felt kind of like old or dusty to me, they always feel very like present. Like I can, I can feel like, oh, they're right here in the room with me. Um, and part of that, I think comes from this almost like psychological exercise of like looking at a painting and imagining how it was painted. And that's what's so important about seeing a uh, painting or handmade objects in person is that you can have that kind of thought experiment. Like I even like stand back, I kind of imagine like how far would I stand from the painting and then you know, if I look at like a Picasso painting or whatever, I'm just like, okay, how would his hand move? And sometimes it's very surprising. Like when I first saw de Kooning's paintings, they look like, blah, 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 like abstract expressionist paintings. And I rem remember seeing like a film of him painting and it was like, he was just like sit there and look, they pick up his brush and he'd be like, he was painting it about like that speed. And then it, the brush mark looks like that, but there's this precision to the structure. So. Um, all of those kinds of things of kind of projection and thought and memory, I think, happen uh, when you encounter painting. And that, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that because it kind of gets to the reason why, even with all this interest in digital image making and stuff, I'm still like primarily very much like a painter. And I'm very interested in like that, like physically making the whole painting myself with a brush and all that kind of stuff, because I like embedding that kind of encounter um, in the painting and then having that kind of communication across like space and time with someone else on the other side of it. Um, so this is a painting of mine from about four, five years ago. Um, and I was at the time, just to give a little context for the work that kind of preceded the work that's in this show, um, I was making all these paintings of very interested in anamorphic, um, representations of figures as a way of like kind of compressing and stretching and just sort of moving figures through a kind of semi uh, abstract space. Um, and there was a whole narrative with these figures at the time, all of the, the, the figures that would come into these paintings were from this one movie, uh, it was from this movie called The Money Pit with Tom Hanks and Shelley Long. I was like obsessed with this movie. I had like five or 600 stills. I would just watch it in uh, like, like, uh, like the slowest, like frame by frame speed. This is a really weird movie because it's like a, a slapstick comedy, but it's shot like a horror movie, you know, like the lighting in it is like, and the house is like a horror movie house and it's shot like on location. Um, and it has these very strange things that, that kind of happen in it in this relationship of the, the protagonists of the figures in the house and then the house as a protagonist itself as a character. And that's, that's I mentioned that because um, even in the current work, that's a preoccupation that I have where I want the, the setting to feel as present as whatever is happening in the setting, those things to kind of be competing a, a little bit. Um, and then the, in the work that kind of immediately preceded this work that's in the show, sort of going forward on that, I started to get really interested in um, transparency as a way of kind of vertically collaging images. Um, so I always had this kind of collage aesthetic of like liking to see things kind of juxtaposed um, or bumped up against each other or overlapping. And this um, transparency allowed me to kind of collage not just this way, like laterally across the canvas uh, or, or image, but sort of vertically like into the space and out of the space. And then it also did this other thing, getting back to acknowledging the viewer where it, um, if you have two or three images that are kind of equally painted up, 
they they compete for your attention and it becomes and you, and you have this feeling of like you're looking at one or looking at the other it's like the the thing of like you can see a a rabbit or an old woman or you know you can see the positive space or the negative space and you can sort of feel this muscle shift in your brain when you decide to see uh pluto with his face in a, a can of paint um or my wife putting on like mime makeup uh for a halloween costume you know you can sort of see these two images and they kind of compete for your attention and they have a weird uh interaction um so these paintings were all uh at this time roughly 20 by 16 inches for the most part, um, all sort of working off of that, that same idea. And I'll, I'll talk more later about the, the sort of subject matter of a lot of these paintings that's continued into the current work. Um, but when I made this painting, uh, this, it's about, this was a, a larger uh, painting in that, in that body of work that's a, the size of, of these paintings, it's four by five feet. And I had this experience of like, I've always loved um, looking at like old photographs and, and I'll just like I stare at them as like hard as I can to see if I could just like imagine myself in that space. You know, like, what was it like to be that person? <laughs> Whatever people do, it's sort of nerdy, but like it tried to project myself into that space. And in sort of making these paintings, they were very synthetic constructions. They were coming from photographs and I was kind of synthetically constructing them in this collage kind of way. Um, to come up with these, uh, they're sort of sourced from photographs. But in this painting in particular, this thing happened where, because of the way I had uh, sort of assembled this painting, uh, the, the light that's hitting this kangaroo was, uh, se seemed to be casting a shadow onto this other image. And I was really excited about that interaction of the way that the light and shadow was pulling those two things together. So they weren't just like sitting out around each other or hovering one in front of the other, but they seem to be kind of interacting uh, a lot more. And around that time, I got uh, my hands on like a VR, a virtual reality setup. Um, it was like the first iteration of the HTC Vive um, uh, setup. And I, I was into that, that one because it has like these base stations. So it maps you in the space. So you can actually like fully move around in the space at the time, like the Oculus, you could just like turn that way and that way. And that was just more like a, a stereoscope or something. Now I'll show you, like I brought a, an old school stereoscope. It seemed like not as interactive. And what, what I really wanted was to be in the space of these paintings, um, of these constructions. Um, and so I learned also at that time how to do uh, photogrammetry which is like a, a way of just like 3D scanning. I mean, now it's like every two weeks, there's like a new app that gets better and better and better. And you can all 3D scan whatever you want and go into VR. Um, but even this is only like four years ago, this was still very like, I was like, what's this photogrammetry thing? This is really amazing. Um, uh, so the minute I that happened, it kind of radically changed the paintings. And this is a painting that's in the show around the corner here. Um, and it, uh, I was still sort of, so I was making these scans and I was putting photographs in and putting these 3D objects into a virtual space. And it was still very much like um, in the same realm as, as a painting like this. Um, but for me, this painting was like radically different because uh, the difference was that I, I knew this space, like I had inhabited this space and I had like made it more like a still life setup. So it wasn't, it didn't feel like this felt like a synthetic space that I had constructed on the painting, you know, um, it almost sort of from imagination. And this was a space that I was like painting from life. And here's just like a little video of, this is like one of my first like VR 3D setups. And all of these things kind of came up one was like all the glitchiness of bad photogrammetry models. I really liked that. It was kind of like made things have this kind of organic, these organic shapes would pop up that were not just sort of my intentional organic shapes. And then I could sort of move through these spaces and really get to know them before I, I attempted to make a, a painting of them. Um, and also around that time, uh, so for like, probably 10 years, I kept trying to read this book, uh, Swan's Way, the first volume of 
Remembrance of Things Past, or I guess now they're calling it In Search of Lost Time by Marcel Proust. And I, I, I knew this book was like really important to me and I would start it and get like 100 pages in and then get distracted or I get 200 pages in and get distracted. And I kept starting it over and over and over again for a number of years. And at this time, I finally kind of got, got into it and finished the whole book uh, without distraction. That must have been moving to Iowa. I got a lot of headspace when I moved to Iowa. I uh, had time to read. Um, and there's a passage in uh, that book where he's talking about uh, being a child and going up to bed and having a magic lantern in his bedroom. And the magic lantern uh, would project these images that would sort of scroll around the room. And the images would like move over the curtains and move over the windows. And he talks about that to him being as a child, like a really terrifying experience because it, it made him hyper conscious of the, the physicality of the world to sort of see these images undulate over physical objects. And I kind of wanted to understand that a bit more. And I've always been interested in um, these, the kind of echoes that happen throughout history, especially even like visual echoes, like that, the way that that Holbein thing looks like a Photoshop collage or the way that a stereoscope viewer looks just like a VR headset. And, and um, those kind of visual rhymes for me are often like entry points into these sort of historical rhymes. So I, I started buying, off of eBay, um, like I bought a couple of old magic lanterns from uh, the turn of the from late 19th and early 20th century. And then I started buying all these hand painted glass slides. And I just got really into these things as these objects, um, the way that they were like screens, the way that they came alive through being backlit, you know, like the way a screen, a computer screen comes alive through being backlit. And then the way that they projected out onto the world and sort of um made they, they were they also had a the projected image these bright colors had a thinness to it and that was like a, an experience that i had the first time i went into vr it was very so strange that everything is just skins there's no bones you know there's no muscle there's no bones everything is just like skin and you just like move through the skin and come back out so everything feels very thin and in fact the first time i was in vr like i made a photogrammetry model of like my studio table. And then I went in VR and I was using this model and I was scaling it up and like taking it apart and putting it back together. Um, and, it, and I came out of VR and it was like the weirdest feeling because there was the real thing itself. And it felt, somehow it felt immediately just, it, it wore off really fast, but I felt this feeling of like the thinness of our perception, like the thinness of our senses, like that we're very easily tricked. Um, it only took about 30 minutes in that space before I was just like, oh yeah, this is how the world works in here. There's no gravity. I can scale things up and down. I think we have that feeling when we go into like video games, probably have that feeling you go into like even books, like a really good book um, or film, you, you kind of lose this sense of yourself or you, you very easily give over to the new rules um, like you might in a dream or something. Um, so anyway, I showed these and I brought some of them because um, they, they, they kind of act as these uh, sort of like anchors or punctuation points for me. Um, and they, they make their way into a lot of the work. So a lot of the work in the show, you'll see little vestiges of these things um, pop up. And I, I liked as objects, I liked them. I liked the way they were like scratched and marred and beat up because they were just like on glass and they're like hand painted or hand uh, printed or whatever. Um, and so they'd been sort of messed up over time. And uh, to me, like all of these little marks and gouges were like these beautiful drawing marks, you know, this. Um, and so uh, like you can see this thing makes its way into those paintings uh, there. And it's, I'm, I'm treating the, um, all those kind of gouges and all those imperfections as like the way I would treat like leaves on a, uh, a tree or something if I was painting it. They're like exciting points of detail that I could like bounce off of or describe. Um, oh, this is just like, um, if you're in the exhibition, there are these three AR works, uh, augmented reality works. And one of them that's back here is this book. And just, uh, I made uh, these two pages of text on it intentionally blurry. So you couldn't really read them. So it would just kind of stand as book, but it is actually Swan's Way and it's the passage 
where he's talking about all of this, uh, all this stuff. Um, and so just a quick side detour to talk about the, the ceramic work. Um, and I'm showing a lot of the work that's kind of like made at the same time as the work in the show, but not in the show, because I figure you can go look at the, the work that's in the show in person. Um, so the ceramic work was really became very directly about that, that uh, Proust idea of the way that like a thin image uh, molds itself to the substrate, like it, it just takes on the shape of whatever's underneath it. And so I was sort of making these more or less flat ceramic slabs and then kind of twisting them or undulating them and then sort of uh, painting onto them with um, underglaze. And if you use underglaze and don't put a clear coat on top, it, it kind of looks like gouache almost. It comes out very matte. But I, I like the idea that I would spend all this time delicately like painting these things and then put them in like the fire, you know, like the kiln for like at, at, at uh, 1500 degrees or whatever um, for a few days. Um, so, and, and then they become almost like, like if you didn't mess with this, this would, could last like a lot longer than an oil painting, at least in my mind, that's how I think of it, it has a permanence and a delicacy to it. Um, similar to the, this sort of like projected image that kind of moves, moves over, sort, uh, moves over a, a form. So these are, and just, this is just like front view, side view, so you can kind of see the thing from the front and see how things, how, how shapes kind of undulate or move over. Um, this is a piece that's also in the show around the corner. I also like with, like with ceramic objects that they don't, I was painting them like paintings, like with a front and a back, but they don't necessarily have a specific orientation of front or back. Like this is kind of like a book and it could be on a table or it could be hung up or it could, they just sort of exist almost independent of the wall uh, as these objects. Um, so then the kind of second category of if I was kind of going through my themes, I like the images themselves and what the what the references are and they're and for basically all of the the work in this show for the most part, about ninety five percent of everything that's in all the paintings is just like the most kind of boring everyday stuff that's in my life that I, I like. It's like my friends, my cat, my daughter, my daughter's toys, like like the walk to the studio, it's all that kind of stuff. And I, I've always been really, I think Flannery O'Connor, I've been looking for this quote, I read it like a really long time ago and I haven't ever been able to find it again. She said something about everything you ever need is like on your block, like, like everything you need for, she probably said for salvation or something like that is like on your block, like, like all of the experience that you need is in that small um, space of your little world, um, which is probably not entirely true, but. Uh, that's for another discussion. But anyway, so the, the, the stuff that's, that's in these paintings is all kind of very much um, very pedestrian stuff from my life. And, and there's this thing that happens when you kind of like pull like a like this old beer bottle um, from, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and I was sort of have this like very old Rainier beer bottle that I was like, this is so cool, uh, this little object. Um, when it's pulled into that space of virtual reality, it becomes very weird. Things become very weird in there. They feel, like I said earlier, they feel like they're just like floating skins with nothing underneath them. They also have this kind of doppelganger, uncanny quality where they feel like they're the thing, but not the thing. And they, they're malleable in different ways. Um, so everything in this painting, for instance, is like, you know, it's like my wife's feet and her sandals and the grass in her backyard, these like rock forms are, these little sculptures my friend made and that's like Smurfette's head from a, like one of my daughter's toys and then like our shed, the side of our shed. Um, and it, but when you take these things into this virtual space, they become this kind of jumping off point for something that's very strange. Um, it's important to me that they're of the everyday though. Um, I think uh, the critic who recently passed away, Dave Hickey said something like, you know, like everything else in our life is, is there to like orient us and make us feel stable. 
and art could be like the one thing that's intentionally disorienting us and, and sort of like making you understand that the things that feel familiar are, are actually incredibly mysterious and unknowable. Um, there's also this great quote by the painter Domenico Noli, where he says, I can speak only for myself, but for me, imagination and invention cannot generate something more important, more beautiful, and more terrifying than the common object amplified by the attention that we give it. And if you've ever, I always talk to my, I, I show this quote to my intro drawing students, because like, uh, I remember having to do a, like an eight hour study in art school of like a little section of bark on a tree. And at a certain point I was like, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. This is like little, like one foot section of bark. Cause it's like when you penetrate past like, like malaise and boredom and, and uh, get kind of to the next level, these, you start to realize like, oh, like everything you need is around you. Like everything is like really exciting and, and, uh, and sort of mysterious. Um, the other thing I think about a lot is uh, this print by uh, Francisco Goya. Um, it's one of the Disasters of War um, series. And there's this, I, I can't remember if it's on multiple of the prints, um, but on this print in particular, um, he wrote at the bottom, Yolo V, um, I saw it. Um, and that to me has always been this like, like really important declaration. Like this is something I saw, like, like this declaration of witnessing, like I didn't make this up. And I think it was really important to him. You know, he was making this series of uh, images of like really crazy things happening. And it was really important to him to write, I saw this, like not, this isn't like from my imagination. Um, and for me with these paintings that became increasingly important is like, they're not surrealist, paintings at all. They're like direct observational paintings of these constructions that I'm making, much more like a still life painting. Um, they're not from, from dreams or imagination in that, in that particular way. And I try to paint them in a way that communicates that. So that hopefully like the, the specificity of the way that they're painted and the way that the light is um, communicates that um, this is something that was observed. Um, as, as strange as they might get, they're all kind of built out of these um, really specific things. Like these are the flowers in our backyard and my friend Hillary's head and this little ceramic pig. <laughs> like, like everything is kind of um, uh, from observation. And one of the things that that allowed to happen in the paintings that was really exciting for me is like when I was more synthetically constructing the paintings, um, from imagination, there was a kind of a uh, feeling of like a need to be for it to be legible. So I'd maybe like over describe certain things or, um, almost in a cartoonish way to make it like clear, like uh, this is what this is. But when you're painting or drawing from observation, you, you feel kind of unburdened from that. Like the thing is real. I don't need to make it more real than it is. Um, and so when I, it felt much more like when I was younger and I would do like landscape painting and the, the encounter that you have in landscape painting is like, whoa, there's like this infinity of information that could never all fit in the painting. And I'm gonna just kind of engage it with description and encounter it and see what comes out of that. And that's, that's sort of how I feel about these spaces. Um, and so it, it, I started letting them get a lot more complicated um, and just kind of like seeing what would happen if I tried to like describe this like um, space that I was, kind of excited about. Um, this other thing that kind of makes its way into a lot of the paintings in terms of the imagery uh, is, and it's in some of the paintings in this show is specifically like these references to Disney cartoons. Um, and I, I got particularly interested in Pluto, uh, Mickey's dog. It's like the one character I think that doesn't talk. Um, and he also, he's also never like, strategizing he's always just reacting to like whatever t weird situation he's in like like uh, for, for a slapstick effect but it I, I like that the way that he encounters things like without an agenda in all these cartoons it just gets himself into trouble um there's some sort of metaphor there that I, I like but then it is also like a kind of a personal 
indicator to me, like, or, or a sort of reference point that I'm trying to refer back to of like um, my original intentions for making art. Like when I was like 10 or 11, I wanted to be a Disney animator. Like, I, I mean, like I really wanted to be a Disney animator. Like I built a light table and I would like make little flipbook animations. And then I wrote to this animator, Glenn Keane at Disney and said like, how do I become an animator, blah, blah, blah. And, and he wrote me back and he was like, well, first you gotta learn how to like really draw from life. And then here are a bunch of schools, like colleges that Disney recruits from. And he gave me this list of colleges. And I was like, oh, I've heard of the Kansas City Art Institute. Like my family, I have family in Kansas City. So I was like, I'm gonna go there. And I ended up going there. But by the time I got there, I was like, didn't wanna be an animator anymore. I wanted to be like a, a real artist. Um, but I, I, uh, I still think back about that time and the kind of original excitement about images. I try to like make sure I'm kind of keeping that sort of innocent excitement just about looking at stuff and that I'm in, an enjoyment of, of, of looking and describing. Well, there's that Pooh Bear in this painting from the that VR earlier. Um, so yeah, a lot of these Disney kind of things make their way in. The other thing that they do, the other way that they function, which is a little bit more of like a formal thing, is like the a cartoon image um, next to a more modeled um, image or juxtaposed with that or interacting with that kind of makes you, again, going back to acknowledging the viewer, makes you kind of conscious that there are different ways that, that you can intentionally deploy different kinds of visual languages. And, and if you kind of put them in direct comparison to each other, um, they kind of highlight each other um, in a way. Uh, so then just in terms of the construction of the paintings, I talked a bit about that already, but the, um, I'm making these kind of virtual environments again, more like still life or, or some of them are like landscape uh, size, like room size, like I'm in there kind of moving around and getting to know them and sort of seeing them. So there's a lot that is not in the, uh, in the paintings that is kind of like background knowledge that I have of the, of the space. But um, as, I've, as I've been making them, I've sort of been building up this like archive or atlas of different 3D objects and, and so it's like almost like I have this folder on a computer that's like a giant shelf in the studio of still life objects that I, that's like, you know, it's a, there's a lot of them, but it's still a relatively limited palette and I can kind of go and pull things and start constructing things. Um, so a lot of times what I'll do is, especially for a bigger painting that I know is gonna take a longer period of time, it might be triggered by uh, like, oh, I want to make a model of this thing and, and have it be the protagonist that I begin to build some kind of scenario around. But in building that scenario around the protagonist, I'm usually just provisionally like reaching for what's ever in the studio um, in order to kind of construct uh, this space. And so the, uh, the same object can come up again and again in different paintings and function in totally different ways. Um, and especially with scale and position and lighting that that can change things and it goes again back to like like I teach painting and drawing and if I have a student who's like oh I want to paint like a mountain in the back of this uh thing uh I I might say you know instead of going going to google image search uh and like Google image searching mountain, which gives you like the most generic images that have non-specific lighting and all this kind of stuff. Um, and that you don't really know, I might say, you know, like go out, go outside and look for like a rock or like a pile of dirt or something because things kind of echo. Like we all know that like little things look like big things. And if you find like a nice little shaped rock and light it from the side, it will look, it, it can stand in for a mountain. Uh, in a painting. It can sort of provisionally give you something to describe that has uh, specificity. And that the kind of specificity that it has is different from a, from a photograph. Not one being better or worse than another, but, but just they just they're different. Anyway, so just an example of that. Um, this flower form, which was in uh, this painting, sort of functioning as a as a flower with this like long stem and this weird coil uh, vase thing. Um, 
comes up in, in this painting, functioning sort of as a flower, but more as like a foreground shock of red. Um, it's in this painting, which is in the back, again, functioning just as like a point of attention for these eyes, but much more as like a non-representational shape sort of, but a shape that would still have light and form. Um, it's in this painting, it's back here. Uh, so if you start kind of looking, um, that was what, one thing that was exciting in putting this show together was to see these things kind of communicating back and forth and to get to not see the, that repetition like sequentially, but see it spatially like in a room. Um, anyway, so the, the last thing I wanna talk about in relationship to the construction of the paintings, um, just using this painting as an example, that's right here. And this was the last painting I made that was actually like wet when we installed the show. Um, <laughs> I think it's maybe dry now, I don't know. Um, but uh, in these bigger paintings, the, the kind of most recent thing I've gotten really interested in is like um, getting really invested in every part of the painting, just like letting myself get totally invested in every part of the painting and trying to make like, it's sort of a weird thing, but trying to like make a painting that doesn't let you down at all. <laughs> like, like usually like most paintings, I'm like, I really like that part. As I move my eye down there, no, I like that part so much. Like it's not so good. Or like this painting's really, I really like this painting from across the room. And then I get up to close to it, and what a disappointment, you know. Um, and so I'm trying to make a painting, especially with these bigger paintings, just to see what happens if I try to make a painting where like you fall in love with every part of the painting. So when I'm working on these sections of the the painting, um, and this is very different. I used to work completely differently. Like I used to make these giant like six by seven, six by eight foot paintings. And I paint the whole thing and uh, sand it out and paint it again. And there were these very process driven paintings. And these paintings are much more like, like a painting like this is more like painting 20 small paintings almost. Um, and that's why it's sort of important to kind of know a bit about the blueprint of where things are gonna go ahead of time. And, and it's still, a Somehow to me, it's an even more mysterious and exciting process than, than those process paintings. Because one thing that would happen if I would just go into the studio and not have a plan and not know what I was gonna do, and just like, ah, tack the canvas and I'll sand it and I'll tack the canvas again. I found that like, I have a, a very limited palette of moves and I have a, ha a lot of habits and I would just deploy the same moves over and over and over again to solve problems. And so the paintings had a kind of like, sameness and it was actually very hard to introduce something new because my, I would always go back to that same solution you know I always do this swoopy mark and then this or something like that but in these paintings where there's a lot of work ahead of time on them uh, they provide a lot of resistance to that and they provide this kind of other element that I'm sort of bumping up against and I, I like that a lot and it, it sort of keeps me on my toes like I'm constantly having to try to invent new ways to make the brush move in order to describe certain areas that I'm trying to describe. Um, so I try to kind of move through these paintings um, and not release that area of the painting until I sort of fall in love with it or, or like until I'm convinced by it or I feel convinced by it. Um, and that, again, I say that's like a little bit impossible because you do, you feel convinced by something one day and then you come back like two weeks later and you're like, well, that wasn't convincing. That, you know, you feel differently uh, over time. And that's kind of the, the iterative uh, process of painting. Um, so that's, that's what I have <laughs> to talk about today. But if you have questions, I, I didn't show a lot of the work that's in the show. So if you, if you have questions about uh, other stuff, uh, there's a lot of stuff I didn't talk about. Um, but if you have questions about other stuff in the show um, or about my process, I'm happy to, to answer them. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, first of all, thank you. I thought it was wonderful and looking at your work. With more knowledge makes it even 
more special than the first half. Thank you. I'm really interested in the way you speak to the viewer in these pictures. And from my experience in listening to what you're saying, I feel like optically, for you, and I might be using the wrong terms, but visually or optically, the paintings invite them. I mean, they, they, they have all these details, they have um, probably a little bit of back and forth, busy objects juxtaposed with other objects. So visually, I'm really invited in. But once I started to go in, there's no space. So that it's not like a window into another world where you can wander around and live that landscape. It's like you remain eyes, you remain visual. Is that, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. That's something I didn't talk about. Um, so. For me, the, the kind of double vision that I have when I'm making the paintings that that's like completely embedded in me. Um, like I, I started out as a non-representational painter. Um, like when I was in art school, it's like, like minimal non-representational paintings. I was always drawing and stuff on the side, but like um, one of the reasons that I like kind of intentionally started moving back toward representation um, well, there's a bunch of reasons that, that sort of hit on a lot of things you were saying. Um, one was, I have this feeling like I don't like that distinction between abstraction and representation. I had a painting professor once who said it very well, where people were, we were in a crit and somebody was like, well, this is abstract, this is uh, uh, representational. And, and he was like, what are you guys talking about? There's no, there's like, there's figurative and non-figurative, but all painting is abstract. Like it's not the thing itself, it's an abstraction of the thing. And I, I have that feeling very strongly when I'm painting where um, like I feel equally that I'm, I can feel myself painting the gesture and the mark and the color and wanting that to, to sort of hold its own as a, as a move, as an object. And then also that it's describing a form um, and I think that's maybe where it's not, I'm not actually that interested in illusion in that way, like that you would get lost in it. And so, but I, I started using representational painting also because I felt like, I like that it, it gives a point of access for a, a wider range of, of, of viewers. And, and then even the Disney imagery specifically, I like that Disney is not, I would say it's like, universally recognizable, but it's pretty like globally recognizable, like Mickey Mouse, Pluto, like it's like, it, it sort of, um, it gives you like an immediate point of recognition that pulls you in. And the, the same with like light and description and form and modeling, it, it might it, it might sort of like, like pull you in. And, and so all the other stuff that I'm interested in, I feel like I wanna make something that's, uh, engaging enough to look at that you would enter into it and then be there for all the other stuff you know like that it would um yeah like sort of invite you in i, I want to make things that you want to look at for a long time i remember like i've spent a lot of time in new york and i would like go to shows and the main way you would always see people walk into galleries and they'd walk around shows like this it's like and I think they, I mean, I was a museum guard in Kansas City too. And um, I think the average time that people look at paintings is something like 18 seconds or something. And, and I, I can attest to this, like if there was a text plate, and it's why I like never want to put like text plates next to my work. Like if there was a text plate, people would come up and they'd look at the painting and then they'd spend about 30 or 40 seconds reading the text plate and they glance at the painting and then they move on. So they spent more time reading about the painting than like looking at it. And then I remember seeing this like, uh, going into Neil Rouse show, um, I don't know if you know this painter, he had a show at the Des Moines Art Center, but um, I saw a show of his at, at David's Werner in New York and I went in and, and David's Werner in Chelsea in New York, it's like the primo place where people go in and talk about lunch and don't really look at the work, you know, people just kind of like, mm, so where are we going next, you know, and I went into that show and everyone was just like, like staring at the paintings, like standing there for like a long, uncomfortably long periods of time where you'd be like, is that person gonna move so I can get in there and look at the painting, you know? And I, I love that. I love like work 
that people would stay with long enough to like have a contemplative experience that, that doesn't like just want to kind of scroll by or like move by. Um, and so right now, maybe I'm kind of doing that in the most, like the dumbest way, which is just like pack it with as much stuff as possible. Like there's pro I'm sure there's like a, there, I know that there's a more, I teach with people who can like do a more refined, like rarefied version of that, where you just like get lost in a moment of red or something like that. But like that, I, I'm sort of doing it the other way, which is just like put the whole kitchen sink in and like um, see what happens. But I, uh, but I hope that like um, the thing that the VR did that, that, I, that for me was really important um, was that I felt like light was a way that I could unify really complicated situations. So um, light and shadow became a way to kind of create a feeling of continuity, even if there was like a lot of crazy juxtaposition or a lot of complexity. And I feel like uh, that really does come out because in your work, the marks are just as important as what they define. And the random, like you were saying, those random marks from VR that are left over when you go through that uh, process totally accurately. You know, they're as important as the figure that was there. So everything gets equal weight, which is a very different world. Um, nothing's been pre-selected, which is how most paintings are. They select what viewers should see. But here it's sort of like, here's everything. <laughs> Yeah. So, so yeah, and that and that actually I didn't mention this, but like my first the first time I thought, well, maybe this like technology thing could be of interest. Like this uh was um I'd been I was really into like northern renaissance painting and uh, Gerard David and like Petrus Christus and these like paintings on panel were just like everything is so crystal clear, like it's almost like they're non-hierarchical, like visually, it's not and and then I remember seeing these like stills from um, the video game Call of Duty. And I was like, that looks like Northern Renaissance painting. Like everything was like so textured and like, like the skin of everything was like perfectly textured. And, and the, even the, the modeling on the forms looked like Northern Renaissance uh, figures. And I was th that kind of like snapping through history that was like not something I arrived at through like a theory or something like that. I just kind of like, it was an experience that I had um, yeah, that made me think of that. And then I, I think a lot about like, in terms of the actual action of painting, like I love like Manet and I love uh, Tintoretto um, and I love Veronese. I, I, I like that kind of, and, and the Tiepolos, like the Menico and Giovanni Tiepolo. Um, like if I go to the Art Institute of Chicago, like I'm up close to those paintings, looking at them because they always have that feeling where you have this kind of dual experience of seeing the mark and the, the thing that it's describing at the same time, and they're both exciting. Um, yeah. 